Well, we'll just go ahead and get started. And unfortunately, those who didn't attend, they're just going to miss out. So you, you will get some nuggets of wisdom that the people online will not get. Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Steve Wilson. And oh, one minute. You want me to wait or go? Oh, go ahead. OK, I got the thumbs up. So we're good. So maybe they'll actually get it online. So my name is Steve Wilson. And um, I uh, work for a company called HashiCorp. Uh, maybe you've heard of us, maybe you haven't, but you might have heard of some of our tools like Packer or Vagrant or Terraform or Vault or Console. So <clears throat> that's the company that I <clears throat> excuse me, work for. And uh, a little bit, just a little synopsis about me. Uh, I've been working in IT or computers in one way, shape, or form or another since I was eight. So it's, I've, I've been you know, kind of around this space for a, a long, long time. And, uh, and I just wanted to start sh uh, to kind of travel around and share some of the observations that I've been making. Uh, I've, I've seen some of the great um, uh, talks that have been here. And a lot of them have really get a little bit of feedback. And a lot of them have been really uh, centered around uh, the tactical implementation of how do we do DevOps better, right? How, how do I bring some of these uh, concepts back and implement them in a way that is consumable? Uh, and that is not what this talk is about. This talk is more a little more inspirational uh, in the context of how do I really measure or look at what we're doing and kind of give, a, give me some milestones or guideposts along the way that give me an indication or an idea uh, that uh, we're moving in the right direction. Because making this transformation in the context of the overarching business and the, the idea of digital transformation in and of itself uh, can be a little daunting. And sometimes you need some, some, uh, a map or some milestones along the way uh, to kind of help keep the ship steering in the right direction uh, when, the, when the storms kind of come. Uh, this is me, you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, unfortunately, Right after I'm done with this, I have to jump in a car and go right to the airport so that I can fly home and be with my family tonight. So if you have questions, I can't stick around and, and answer them, but you are more than uh, uh, welcome to hit me up on Twitter and we can kind of go back and forth uh, if you have any, any thoughts or questions uh, after this talk. So unfortunately, I won't be able to, to stay and kind of chat afterwards, but feel free to, to quip and, and you can roast me and flame me uh, as well. So. Uh, uh, pithy comebacks are always welcome on my Twitter feed. So last night, uh, I flew in to Des Moines, uh, and unfortunately, like most people uh, that travel quite a bit for work, uh, I was caught in the delay and actually sat in Detroit for over five hours, waiting to get a flight to, to come here and be with you this morning. And as I was kind of sitting there and, and uh, contemplating my life choices and Maybe I didn't actually make the right ones. Um, I started to think a little bit about what I was going to speak on here um, and kind of add some, uh, some context to it. And I began to kind of think about this idea of just travel and things of that nature and, and how it kind of relates to this whole construct of, of DevOps. Uh, and I, I kind of came up with a comparison that, uh, that I wanted to share with you. And, and you know, a lot of times, when we look at things as far as in IT, we kind of, we look at them in the context of going on vacation. Uh, when we go on vacation, we, we sit down with our laptops, we pull up Travelocity, we sit with our spouse and maybe our kids or maybe just with friends and we go, where do we want to go? How long do we want to be there? Uh, what are the things we want to do? And we plan everything out and we book cars and book flights and, and book hotels and everything else. And, and we build up this level of expectation we build up this idea of we know what we expect that when we go on this, we go on this trip that certain things are going to happen, certain things are going to be in place, and, and everything happens uh, in, a, in a kind of a sequenced event. And then we start into this journey and kind of move forward, and then all of a sudden our flights are delayed. We miss connections. Uh, room service didn't happen, and we start to get you know, kind of upset. Like, don't they know who I am? Uh, last night I was standing outside waiting for the Uber and a guy came in. He's like, I've flown with Delta for like 15 years and they wouldn't change my flight and all this stuff. And he just began to kind of go into this uh, long story about, you know, how he felt he, he should be on this trip. And that's because the expectations get built up. And a lot of times when we start to go down these DevOps digital transformations, we do the same thing. 
we plan it out. We, we get some idea of where we want to go and what it's going to look like at the end. And we kind of go forward. And then as you progress through it, a lot of times you kind of get down the road and all of a sudden, a lot of different things that have happened start to say, well, why isn't it working this way? Why aren't we doing it? Why isn't all of a sudden, doesn't everyone see it? Doesn't everyone see that we need to do this and be on this way? And there comes a level of, of disappointment and, and dissatisfaction and sometimes even full-blown abandonment because we look at it in that context. And so I'd like to propose to you kind of a, a philosophical or a mental shift on this and really start to say, going down a, a process of transforming IT into doing DevOps delivery is not like going on vacation, but it's like having a child. First of all, no one is ever ready to have a kid. Okay, for those of you who are parents in the room, parents in the room, okay, uh, hands up, keep your hands up just with me, stay with me. How many of you, by a show of hands, were fully prepared and ready for that baby? Yes, and anybody whose hand is still up, they are lying to you. You are a liar and you, you, you shame on you. No one is ever, ever ready to have a kid. No one is ever ready. To, I mean, they're like, oh, we got this baby. What if I drop it? You know, what if I, I, I drop my kid? Both of my kids once. I did it both times. Once, changing tables, it happens, right? It's parents, we've all done it. We don't admit it, but we've done it. Right. And and that's and that's the thing is you're never really ready. You don't really know what this kid is going to look like when they're 18 or 20. You have hopes, you have aspirations, you have ideas, you have dreams, but you don't really know at the end what it's going to look like. And you have to kind of roll with the punches. You have to kind of shift things around and, and things don't always go that way. But we have a lot of patience and a lot of grace and we start to look at things and that and like Oh, well, it didn't work out exactly, but still they're, they're still doing their thing. And that's how you have to start to think about a move or a shift in a cultural setting around moving to DevOps and this idea that things aren't going to go the way you thought. You're going to go on this journey. You're married. You can't just like at six go, oh, well, this didn't work out with this kid, so I'm going to take it back to the hospital and swap it out for another six-year-old who did a better job of, of being ready for things. And so you have to start to kind of shift that mentality and shift that mindset around of I'm, I'm, I'm in with this thing. I'm married. I'm committed to going through and going forward in this journey, even though I don't know what the outcomes at the end are going to be. And we hear a lot about it. You've heard, you know, really, you know, high profile people in the in the community talk about this idea uh, of, of kind of moving in experimentation, failing fast. Having a kid is the same way. There's no manual, there's no guide. You're just experimenting, failing fast, learning from others. And so this talk is really geared around talking about in that, in that context of the shift of you're kind of marrying to it and looking at it as the shift is with the DevOps is into a multi-cloud, hybrid cloud world. How your processes have to change to manage it how your, the way that you approach and think about it has to change and manage it. And I, I tell you about as far as shifting from vacation to child, so that when you move into this direction, you're not just you know, gonna have a project and then look, I have an app and it's out in the cloud, right? No, you're really having to say, how are we going to fundamentally work differently in a completely different model than what we have traditionally handled over the last three decades? And so in those, in those previous decades, a lot of times our, our, our mindset or the way that we looked at it and made assumptions around it is this idea of we built castles, right? We don't call them castles, we call them data centers, but we built castles. And these castles have specific attributes about them that we see. They have high walls, they have, um, you know, they have uh, entry and exit points that are well-defined. We have different areas within it that understand, uh, you know, different gating factors around keys and locks and, and quarters and uh, armory and the treasury. And we have all, the, all those definitions around the, the castle and moat. And in fact, when we want to change things about a castle, we actually don't tear down walls and, and build them up somewhere else. No, we just build a road and we build another castle down the, down the street. 
And when you think about it in the context of IT, we do the same thing, right? We make very well-defined ingress and egress points. We make very well-defined security checkpoints. We assume that people or, or entities inside our castle are authorized to be there. Uh, we assume communication is a well-defined channel with well-defined scopes and roles. We, we assume that how you build castles are always the same right brick and mortar and and those types of things so we bring we bring a lot of assumptions into that and the problem is is that this shift to a hybrid cloud operating model or even a multi-cloud operating model building castles in the cloud just doesn't make sense in fact the, even the processes in which you have fundamentally kind of built things up and built things around actually completely begin to break down and actually go, go against the grain when it comes to what you're ultimately trying to achieve in the context of a high velocity, that, that DevOps workflow that you're moving. And so I would propose to you, if I could, a shift to an idea of a more nomadic lifestyle. You think about it in the context of, of, of a nomadic lifestyle, there are, there are certain attributes about it. How many of you have done like long distance backpacking? Anybody in this room, long distance? I got one, two, a couple of folks here, long distance backpacking. When you go backpacking, every ounce feels like pounds. And so everything that you take with you has to have a purpose and that also has to have a place. And if it doesn't meet either one of those requirements, it doesn't go with you. And if you think about it in, in, in the context of building for a multi-cloud, or a hybrid cloud world, the same thing has to hold true. We talk about you know, increasing flow. We talk about decreasing bottlenecks. Well, when you do that, you have to really think and shift differently. So in, in, a, in a hybrid cloud world, I can't have thick walls. I can't assume high trust. If I have a tent, I don't have much protection. I have to assume zero trust because the land that I live on isn't mine. In the context of provisioning, I have to be able to spin up and, and tear down quickly. And I have to be able to do it repeatedly over and over and over again with a, a level of resiliency and reliability so that things don't break. When it comes to the ability to have connectivity, communication, I have to assume that the, the traversal of that message was over insecure land. I have to be able to validate and verify the authenticity of those messages. I have to be able to handle it in a context of ephemerality, meaning that I, I need to be able to just rotate and swap things out all the time. Security really at this level has to be baked into the process, has to be baked into your deployment flow versus a checkpoint. I, I saw a very interesting quote last week. It was, uh, I, I laughed, but uh, how many of you read that book, Accelerate? Right, okay, I got several. They, there was a very interesting statement and, and they talked about how uh, organizations that have a very robust, very well-defined change management board actually are worse than those who have no change management board whatsoever. And, and it kind of stems into this idea of being able to be more, more nomadic and more nimble within your organization. So if you're baking more and more of these things into your processes, artifacts, you actually can accelerate. Think about it in the context, I can break down a tent, spin it back up very quickly. I know how to move effectively. If I move, I need to be able to have it where other folks can find me. And so looking at your processes and going, can I really be nimble and agile with this? Does it actually make sense? start to think about it more in a nomadic lifestyle. I've, I've talked to uh, uh, communities and kind of shared this with them. And actually they start having conversations about their processes and they actually start shaming each other and go, oh, that's a cat, you're, you're building castles. And so it gives kind of a nice little picture, mental picture and framework that you can communicate with. So as we move into these five marks, it's really, what are kind of the five attributes? And this isn't a, a, a all encompassing list. There are multiple other attributes, but these are kind of like umbrella ideas that you can start to look at as you're moving into a hybrid cloud model. 
Now, don't think that this is a checklist. I mean, we love it. Humans love check. We want to do lists. We want to move down those things. I, I understand that. I'm very much that way too. I, I love to have to-do lists. But these are more of, of how am I doing? What, how are my attributes? And how can I measure those attributes uh, along that line? And so those attributes are these five marks. Uh, goals over technology, immutable as possible, configuration on demand, security baked in, and change at will. Now, all of these things are not independent from one another. If you're doing really well in one area, other things will start to kind of come along with that. You'll, you'll have to tackle some of the things that fit under the umbrella in order to kind of achieve. So you can't just be like really awesome at immutability and really terrible at change. And so they kind of rise and fall together kind of in a... Uh, kind of in a, an attribute level. So let's look at each one of these as we kind of dig into it. The first one here is being goals over technology. This is really more of a, of a, of a conversation that, that folks need to have where they're really kind of looking and measuring out what do they want the end state to look like? What do they want those, those goals or those measurements to look like? And then pick technologies that best fit and best suit achieving those goals. Uh, in the previous talk that was in this room, it talked about they didn't mention tools because there's multiple different types of tooling. And that's true. There's multiple, we sell, we, you know, we have great tools uh, that that's, uh, a lot of folks in this room may either be familiar or using. And in that, in that arena, you should select them because they're actually helping you achieve their goals, not selecting tools and then basing your goals off of those technologies. And people, uh, uh, there's a lot of heads nodding like, yeah, Come on, Steve, that's just like, everybody gets that. Oh, yeah? Who here is moving down the route of Kubernetes? How many of you made that decision because it best suited your goals or it was more of, hey, this, this container thing might stick? With this, this man is a brave soul here. <laughs> I appreciate your honesty, right? There, and, and, and there are others in there. Don't, you are not alone. You're just the brave one. There are, other, there are other, like we're picking technology because it's the coolest widget or it's the latest thing. We're not really selecting and saying, here are our goals. Here's what we want to achieve. How do we best achieve that? And then go, oh, well, this thing aligns best with what we're trying to accomplish. I mean, even in the, the concept of DevOps, we have DevOps teams, DevOps people. And really, it's like, oh, well, everyone else is doing DevOps, so we're going to create a DevOps team, and we don't know what they're going to do, but everyone else is doing it, so we need one of those as well. And I have a statement here that the how you get there is more important than the way that you get there. And that means that the how is the goals-orientated approach versus the way, which is the, the facilities in which you use to meet those goals. An attribute of these goals should be that they should be measurable and be, you should be able to hold yourself and others accountable to those goals. If you can't measure it, then it doesn't matter. And if you can't hold somebody accountable, it'll never get done. Same thing with having a child. You have to be able to measure them. We do it all the time. Yearly checkups, my oldest daughter is getting ready to go to her. She's turning 11 in two weeks. And uh, she's going to go to her checkup and they're going to say, you grew this much. You're, you're now this age. You should expect these things. And then I, myself as a parent have to be able to, I'm holding myself accountable as a father to be able to say, okay, now that she's 11, I can't treat her like she was 10. I can't treat her like she was six. I have to treat her like she's, you know, that, that transitional period of going from a little girl to a young woman. I have to be able to, to view that in a shift. Jumping ahead. The last, the last point here is really around having it visible versus invisible. And this is really that the, these goals and attributes should be somewhere that are always visible to you. You're always looking and saying, where are we moving? Where are we going? This is the kind of the, the concept around like Kaban and the, and the boards and seeing the work in progress versus the done work versus the work to be done, right? We do those things because we need a visual cue to be able to see, okay, A, we are making progress, so we can celebrate that because we have measurable goals and, and accountable to that. 
And at the same time, we have a visual cue that says, what's next, what do I need to do, how do I need to do this? Uh, so that we can constantly not only celebrate those, those milestones, but also hold each other accountable because this is a team effort. The next one here is being immutable as possible. Now, so I've had multiple people, now Steve, I can't be immutable. That's, that's you know, that's, we can't, they don't even say being immutable as possible, they say being immutable is impossible. Now, I, I know that you can't be 100% immutable. In a lot of cases, there are a lot of mitigating factors that, that prevent you from getting there, but the goal should be as immutable as possible. How close can I get to being immutable? Because in the context of immutability, my workflows change, my, my, my processes change, right? I'm not spinning up long-lived services and then layering on configuration over eons. Everybody has those servers that they've been patching and configuring for five, six years, and nobody wants to touch it because they know if they do, like smoke will come out the back and this is like the one connector that the whole thing runs on. You know, we've all heard this idea of pets versus cattle and, and everything like that. And the reality is, is that as you get closer and closer to immutability, your process mindset should always be our deployment or our configuration change or our, our uh, update process is we spin up new and we destroy the old. It makes things easier to test. It makes things easier to be automated. It makes things more predictable. And it actually gets you to that construct of less change more frequently. And so you wanna actually move to this higher level of immutability. If you think about it, the difference between a development web server and a production web server is roughly about 20K. It's the configuration that actually dictates whether that program has a production configuration or a development configuration. And so you should be able to freeze most of the constructs that lead up to that. And also, if you're doing this with other things, VMs and other types of services, like this, containers have this kind of built in natively. And so you're actually just preparing your processes to absorb containers. So instead of having to just spin up a whole new workflow for managing containers, and then we're gonna do VMs the same way, it's like, no, we're gonna have the same workflow regardless of the technology. Back to the first mark, right? Goals over technology. Our goal is to be container prepared. In order to be container prepared, we have to have a mentality of high level of mutability. Well, we need practice and we need one workflow to do that. So regardless of whether it's VMs or containers, we're going to be as immutable as we can. And that really leads into the next one, which is configuration on demand. Because my the difference between web servers and in production and in, in dev are so minimal, then I shouldn't be layering configuration on it either before or after. I should be pulling that config based on where it lands in an environment. That, can, that config should be dynamic. If I land in AWS, I should be pulling config down that's specific to AWS. If I landed in GCP, same thing. If I landed on-prem, the same thing. I should be pulling that configuration from a central repository that is managed and maintained versus layering it on there or doing a lot of, of, of scripting that kind of does a lot of basically for loops through an SSH command. There should be this level or idea of, of pull down that I'm getting versus this heavy loaded front end approach up front. Now this is probably the biggest and most important one. If I were ready to say what are the temple, they're all kind of very important, but this one's a really important one 
because this is where if you really analyze and look at your processes, this is where you have the most constriction of flow within your entire process. And that is around security. Typically security is not baked into your process. It's a checkbox along the way, or it's a gating factor. How many of you have, have just been feverishly working and you've got all this, all these pipelines going and everything's awesome. And you're just, you're almost at that point of leading production. And then security kind of comes in out of nowhere, right? They, they, they come out of the, the cave in which they've been living in and they go, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me see everything that you've done. We don't like any of this because you didn't ask us. So now that we've seen it, it's all wrong. Go back and do it again. How many of you have that happen? It's okay. This is kind of group therapy too. Yes. Yes, people are raising their hand. This, this is a normal thing. Because A, you got to understand their point of view is that, that you know they're trying to be very secure. And for them, security is no change. Right? And on the other side, you're trying to move fast and trying to implement a lot of change. And it's, it, they're juxtaposed to each other. They're actually grinding against each other. And so into, the, into this, you need to start thinking, how can we bake security into the process? How can we bake this idea of making security consumable at a programmatic level? I don't want to, again, back to configuration on demand and being able to pull that configuration. That means I don't bake security, I don't bake credentials into my config files. I need to make security a consumable service that I consume based on my location, just like configuration. If I land in dev, I get dev credentials. If I land in QA, I get QA credentials. If I land in production, I get production credentials. And what that means is, is that now it, it, you have simplified, you've moved to a, a higher immutability because now I don't have to have separate credentials across different platforms or across different config. I now have a single unified workflow of how I distribute credentials. So that regardless of where that app lands, if it lands in AWS, it, it pulls it the same way that if it landed on prem, if it landed in dev, if it landed in production, it doesn't matter. By its very identifying location, that prescribes where it actually pulls down that secret material. So now I'm baking security into my app because I'm actually removing the manual and the, the effort of having it as a part of my config. This is why you can see it here, why th these things layer on top of each other. If you're really good at immutability, you're going to have to get really good at config on demand. If I'm getting really good at config on demand, I got to bake out all the uniqueness out and make it programmatically consumable. And one of those aspects happens to be security. Another thing is, is that secrets, security secrets, PKI certificates, like I saw a very interesting stat. I don't know if anybody's ever seen this before, but I saw an interesting stat that the average life cycle of a, of a certificate in an organization is directly proportionate to the average tenure of an IT operator within that organization. And that is usually about six to eight months beyond the average tenure. Meaning that somebody sets it up and they know that, hey, I'm gonna set this up for six years because I'm not gonna be here after five. Because it's really easy to get certificates out, it's really hard to rotate them and change them. It's very painful. This is a very clear example of, I should be pulling those things on demand. Those things should be short-lived, dynamically generated, dynamically consumable, Database credentials should be dynamically consumable. Cloud credentials should be dynamically consumable and they should have a time to live on them so that they, they, there's no value in them outside of, their, outside of their expiration. Very similar to a hotel key card. When I go to a hotel, I get a key card. That key card is only valuable for the length of my reservation. I have a stack of them at home about this tall and they're absolutely, I can't take one of them with me and go back and open a door to my next hotel, they're absolutely valueless. That's how credentials, that's how secret should be treated in a hybrid cloud operating model.
The last mark here is really around cha like change at will. Right? You shouldn't be getting this idea. I mean, everyone's like, "Hey, we're going to we're going to change, we're going to do change every 2 weeks because that's our sprint cycle. And we're doing good. We're making it." And that's great. But if that's your end goal, then you're selling yourself short. Your goal should always be audacious and be in a place where you're really trying to push yourself. And so you really should be always stretching and pushing yourself to change at will. I should be able to change anytime I want to. Now remember, if I'm immutable and my process is I spin up new and I destroy old, then that change can be well mitigated from a risk perspective. If security is baked in, I don't have to worry about, did I rotate the database credentials? Do I have the right database credentials? Do I need to have a war room call of 65 people on there to make sure that everything is, is working as expected? Because I have a level of predictability when I bring it, when I, when I spin up the new and I go to destroy the old. So I spin up the new, I can make a test to make sure it's working. And if it's working, then I can kill the old. You should be able to get to a point where it's just whenever you want to. And in order to do this, you absolutely 100% have to rethink your change management process. Your change management processes have to be more programmatic. They have to have more automated approval workflows. I mean, if you think about some of your change management process, you have these approval workflows and there are certain gating factors that you have in there that literally have never been denied ever. How many of you have processes where you know I just got to submit it and Chuck in you know whatever is going to approve it, but it takes Chuck three days, but he the, Chuck's never denied it. Chuck's never shut it down. Yeah. Then what's the point of having it? If it's always fine, why do you have to look at it? Change management needs to be really re readjusted and rethought. And at the end of the day, you're still achieving ITIL principles. Just the expression of what they look like isn't what everyone's used to. And so that even though you're achieving the same outcome, because it doesn't look like a ServiceNow ticket, that's like super scary. Like, oh, I didn't see my ServiceNow email come through. And I didn't click on the link and I didn't say, ah, I did my job today. I approved 15 tickets. Yes. And this is really where a lot of times the, the things get gummed up. It's because, because we as humans, we want to have some level of purpose in our lives. And some people's purpose is I approve tickets. I approve changes. I'm the approval board. I'm, I'm, that, that's my thing. That's what I do. But you really have to start rethinking this whole thing. And that comes back to goals. My goal should be change at will. My goal should be less change more frequently. What technology is going to help me do that? How do I reorientate my configuration so that I can do this more effectively? Another thing is, is that when you do this and you do this effectively, you do these kind of five marks at an effective pace, then all of a sudden you always know what your current state is. You always know what the current state of the environment is, meaning I don't need change management because it's now it, it's my state, my, my current world is always codified and it's always understood. Change becomes pull requests. I can track it over time. Your change management database actually becomes GitHub. Because in order to do the other four marks, you have to get a high level of, uh, of codification. And in order to do that, you have to have a high level of automation. And if you're doing, if you're codifying things effectively, you're going to be using some type of version control. And so GitHub could become your CMDB. And out of this, you get a higher level of auditability because change, is, change goes through a process that means that my, my documentation of change becomes an output. It's not a thing I have to do. I don't have to, oh, I forgot I had to go update that spreadsheet. But I couldn't because I had six other fires to do and 
Now I'm out of date. How many of you have CMDBs? You work really hard to get them up to date, but as they're just not, they're never up to date. Yes, thank you, sir. Brave sir, there in the back. You are not alone. So when you start to shift this idea and start to move into this change at will process, it actually affects all the other things about it. You actually end up achieving the things that you want to do in a measurable way just by simply starting to move in these mindsets and these shifts. So I give you these five marks as kind of to go back and, and kind of gauge yourself and say, okay, we want to do DevOps. How do we really match up? Especially how many of you are in some type of hybrid cloud, multi-cloud uh, transition or some type of, we want to move to a, that type of operating model, right? That's it? I figured there'd be more in here. But, that, but the, in that context, go back and measure against these. Go back and kind of say, okay, if, what, how, do we, how do we actually, if we were to be honest and grade ourselves, how could we grade ourselves against these things and really look at things and say, where are we in this scale? Where are we in these five marks as we make these transformations and make these shifts? And then that, this can be a framework where you can begin to ask very honest questions. Why are we, if this is where we want to go, why aren't these defined goals? If this is where we want to go, why do we want to drag this thing along with us, which actually makes zero sense in this direction? And it's okay that we made those decisions 5, 10, 15 years ago. That is, it's totally okay. We're not negating that that wasn't the right decision. We're just saying that the circumstances and things have changed, and so we need to go in a new direction, just like when you're a parent. The way that I treated my 11-year-old when she was 6 totally made sense then. But it does not make sense now and will not make sense when she's 17. And so you have to be adaptable. So I, just with a few minutes left, I do want to just do the obligatory com uh, say, uh, commercial here. And this isn't really to, to sell anything, but it's really to say that, that these are all the open source tooling that you can look at that can help you in this shift. Terraform for provisioning in an immutable and repeatable fashion. Vault giving you programmatic access to security, not only in uh, secrets around dynamic AWS credentials, dynamic PKI certificates, uh, dynamic SSH keys, but even in offering encryption as a programmatic service. So I can submit clear text, get plain text back and vice versa. Console is really the networking glue, the, the power of really looking at console. How many of you have heard of Service Mesh? Right? How many of you are investigating Service Mesh? How many of you know why you're investigating Service Mesh? Can you tell me why? You raise your hand. Oh, anybody else? And now there's no one's going to raise their hand. I mean, Service Mesh sounds cool, but the reality of the situation is, is that it, it, it implemented properly, you are baking security into your communication, right? You're using mutual TLS between hosts to actually be able to communicate. The problem is, is that the fundamental underlying problem when it comes to shifting to that is you have to solve service discovery. You have to have ubiquitous service discovery across your entire infrastructure in order to do service mesh. If you do not have that, you will not succeed. And that's just, that, if you look at it, that's fundamental. There's, when you look at things like Istio, they're making the assumption that everything will be in Kubernetes because Kubernetes natively has service discovery. But how many of you have more than 50% of your workloads running in Kubernetes? Okay, I didn't see, everyone here look around, nobody raised their hand, right? That means that if you really want to go down this idea of secure communication and you're not at least 50% or more in Kubernetes, Istio is not gonna work because it's assuming that you've already solved the service discovery problem. Console has native built-in service discovery. It has native built-in, that's open source. It has native service discovery built-in and native uh, secure connection, service mesh built-in. And that's in the open source that you can utilize and leverage if you wanna move down this idea of service mesh. And Nomad is just one type of scheduler. That this, 
There's, there's a whole host of things that are playing in this context, but Nomad gives you the ability to have scheduling as well. But if you take these tools, and I'm not saying that they're the right tools because I got to go back and follow my first mark of goals over technology. But these definitely, if you look at the goals that you want to do, the, the value of each of these individual tools within the suite actually make a whole lot of sense. That is the reason why I came to work here. Not because I wanted to come and just be a part of a really cool startup, but because these tools actually made sense in the context of the DevOps framework in the context of the five marks of our hybrid cloud operating model. And so with that, I, I guess I would leave a parting shot. We, we'll kind of come back and look at these five marks because I saw people taking pictures. So if you didn't get a chance to get it before, you can get it now and these slides will be available for you to get down. Again, I'll leave you with these five, I'll leave you with this parting shot of these five. Remember, as you go home, that the things that you probably will stick in your head is this idea of, where, hey, when you go back, we're having a baby when it comes to DevOps, we're not going on vacation. Right. And here are some guiding principles. So I appreciate your time. Thank you, everybody, so much for giving me your attention for 45 minutes. Uh, if you want to follow me or uh, or reach out for questions again. My uh, my Twitter handle is at Steve Zero Wilson. You'll see it as the real Steve Wilson. And I'm not I'm not verified. There may be another real Steve Wilson out there as well. But thank you all so much. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. <laughs>